If you have your Bibles, take them and turn with us to Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10 and verse 38. And we are revisiting a text from last Sunday. Um, I shared Mary and Martha's story of hosting Jesus in their home and the choices that each of them made and the drama that unfolded as a result of those choices. And the question and the choice that they had to make as Jesus was there under their roof was, will I embrace that which is needful or necessary? That was, which is pressing or imperative? Will I go for the good portion or just a portion? They had that choice to make, and each and every one of us have that very same choice to make in our lives concerning following Christ. And so in Luke 10, 38 from the ESV, now as they went on their way, Jesus and his disciples, they entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not even care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. (laughs) Have you ever talked to Jesus like that? Go talk to them. Amen. Have you ever mentioned your in-laws to the Lord? Lord, go talk to them. Or your neighbor. Martha was... She was pretty aggressive. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things. But one thing is necessary. And Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Now may I just say this morning that there are many things in life that are needful, that are pressing, but fewer things that are absolutely in necessary or essential. I mentioned last Sunday that that day Martha felt it needful to invite Jesus home for dinner, and that's, that's, that's a good thing. That's a positive thing. Needful to set an extra plate at the table. Needful to throw an extra burger on the grill. Needful to freshen up and straighten up the entire house. Needful to change the sheets in the guest bedroom. After all, this is no ordinary man that's in the house. This man walks on water and and stops deaf ears and opens blinded eyes and causes the lame to walk and even raises the dead to life. Surely these needful things are necessary. Surely these pressing things are imperative. And yet Jesus responds on the heels of all the busyness and says, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. I believe that Jesus was saying to Martha, only one thing is necessary in this moment, and that one thing is me. That one thing is me. Martha, understand Mary's good portion is me. Mary's priority is me. Mary's passion on this particular day is me. I am her pursuit and her passion. And that is the good portion. In other words, if you just really break it down to ordinary life, Jesus said, she's chosen me over the meatloaf. Can I get a witness? Huh? That day, Mary's necessary was sitting at Jesus' feet, absorbing his presence, listening to his words, gazing into his eyes, and offering her heart as a sacrifice of praise. She had a heart of a young shepherd king named David. We pen these words in Psalms 27. One thing have I asked of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. One thing, one thing he said I've asked of the Lord. Psalms 38, 9. O Lord, all my longing is before you. Psalms 42, 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I appear? Come and appear before God. When shall I have an audience with God? 
This was Mary's heart. I want us to understand this morning, many are the duties of life. Many are the duties of life. But there must be only one devotion that is the driver of our lives. And that devotion is to Him and to Him alone. Because at the, end of the day, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters in life is your relationship with Christ. Your relationship with Christ. Notice what Jesus says about Mary's choice. Martha, Martha, you're anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary, and she has chosen the good portion which will not be taken away from her. Mary has chosen the good portion, the good part. Mary has chosen me over the pressing, over the urgent, over the meatloaf. The noise of the pots and pans of the kitchen has not deterred nor distracted her from being here with me. And we have all of this noise in our life that pulls us away from our just being there with him. Therefore, Mary's choice of divine intimacy and spiritual chemistry and kingdom connection will never, now think about this, will never be taken from her. In other words, Jesus was saying, there is no power on earth or under the earth that can pry her out of my heart. This intimacy, this relationship with me will will always be there, can always be there. Romans 8 and 35, Paul said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, famine, nakedness, danger or sword, knowing all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor any else in all creation will be, will be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. There is nothing, no power, no person that can pry you out of the heart of God. Choose the good portion and that portion will never be taken from you. And that day, Mary was promised a legacy, listen, a legacy of love and affection from the lips of the lover of her soul, lips that would never recant nor rescind the promise of eternal devotion. Jesus made that statement over her. No one, nothing will ever pry you out of my heart. That is eternal security. Now, fast forward. Turn your Bibles to John chapter 12. And let me just focus on this for the next few moments. John chapter 12, verse 1. I mentioned last Sunday that every time that Jesus was in the neighborhood, he was always stopping over at Bethany. There's no telling how many nights that him and his disciples stayed in Mary and Martha and Lazarus' house. And I asked the question last week, what does it take, what does it take for God to feel comfortable in your house, to hang his hat on your hat rack, to sit in your recliner, to pull up under your table? What does it take? Would he feel, does he feel comfortable in your home? It's not just enough for you to feel comfortable with him in church, but does he feel comfortable where you spend most of your time? I think it's a valid question for us to consider. And so here, Jesus and his disciples, they are back again, just days away from the crucifixion. And we see in verse 1, six days before the Passover, Jesus therefore came to Bethany where Lazarus was whom Jesus had raised from the dead. So this had had already taken place. So they gave a dinner for him there. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those reclining with him at the table. And all the men said, (laughs) that's your opportunity to say, it's in the Bible. Amen. 
in verse 3. As Martha's serving and Lazarus is there kicked back with Jesus. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made from pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. See, he had problems way before his betrayal. Jesus said to that response, Leave her alone so that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For the poor you always have with you, but you do not always have me. So I want you to notice a couple things from this passage. Notice, Jesus and the boys are back again at, at Bethany. Actually, in Simon the leper's house, maybe a neighbor down the street, but the whole crew, is, the whole gang is there. Lazarus is a walking, breathing miracle. Jesus had raised him from the dead. Martha is serving without concern or complaint. How many is thankful that Martha got her act together? So there's hope for all of us that struggle with stuff. Amen. Jesus loved her and helped her, and now she's serving without complaint. But Mary, she is taking this Jesus thing to a whole nother level. I want you to see this, for she has moved from, in our original text earlier, she has moved from sitting at, at his feet, listening, to worshiping at his feet. It's a progression. She has moved from listening to every word he spoke to lavishing her love upon him. It's a progression. She has moved from the shadows of the sidelines to the spotlight of the center stage. She has moved from necessary to notable. She has moved from necessary to notable. Notice what Mark remembers about this unforgettable day as Jesus defends Mary's action in Mark chapter 14 and verse 6. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you, and where, whenever you want, you can, you can do good for them, but you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. And we are telling her story again on the corner of 89th and South May 2015. Good job, Mary. Notable, notable. In essence, Jesus declared, Mary has done a notable thing here today, and it will be told in memory of her as her divine legacy. What is your legacy? What is your legacy going to be all about? What will people remember you for? That's your legacy. So what was Jesus' point that day concerning notable? I believe he was saying Mary has done something today that deserves to be noticed. Mary has done something today that is remarkable and impressive. Mary has done something today that is well respected and duly noted by heaven. Mary has done, done something beautiful to me that is deeply loved and much appreciated, Jesus said. How long has it been since Jesus can say of us, they have done something beautiful to me or for me that is deeply, deeply appreciated, that heaven noticed and heaven has well respected. I want you to consider her steps from necessary to noble. Just two steps I want to share with you this morning. Her steps from necessary, choosing Jesus, listening to the Lord, 
and yet embracing him with a heart that was willing to give all. The steps from necessary to, to notable. The first step is the fact she was willing to be generous with her life. Notice in John 12, 3, Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made with pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. There is so much packed in this verse. But I want you to see this. Mary takes a pound, which is about a half liter of pure nard or spikenard, an aromatic amber-colored essential oil, a very costly, very expensive perfumed ointment valued at, the disciples valued it at 300 denarii, which reflected a year's wages in Palestine. Now, what do you make a year? Mary, without hesitation and without reservation, poured it out on Jesus. That which would be equivalent to $10,000 of today's currency. I, I just want you to see that, that what she did was a very big thing. We just read over and say, well, that was nice. No, it's, it's, it's much more than just nice. Amen? Because if you wrote a check out for your year's salary, your annual income, and you dropped it in the offering plate, I tell you what would happen. On Monday morning, our secretaries would ring me. And they would say something like, we had a nice check in the offering yesterday. It was such a sweet thing that someone did for the kingdom. No, that's not what they would say at all. Matter of fact, they wouldn't even buzz my phone. They would shout across the hall, Pastor, come in here quick! You know, I remember years ago, on a Sunday evening, I'd preached and I'd given an altar call and invited people to come and pray and people would come and it was one of those rare times that I had the opportunity just to kneel and pray myself. And so I just knelt down right over here, matter of fact, and was just praying and someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, uh, can, can I speak with you? And I was a little ticked, I'll be honest, you know, this one time that I had opportunity to pray and you know, crisis. And I said, sure, what do you need? He said, well, can we talk somewhere private? So not only was he disturbing my prayer time, but he was now moving me from the altar to a private place. I said, sure. I said, how about down the hall, classroom? Perfect. So we walked into this classroom, and the first thing that he said to me, he said, how do you handle your money? I was like, well, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I mean, do you have a safe here at the church? How? I said, we have a safe. Uh, yes. He said, yes, we have a safe. He said, okay, well, I, I just want you to know that he said, I, you know, I cashed in some of my retirement, and he said, I paid my tithe, and I wrote a check and dropped it in the offering this evening. I just want to make sure it was, it was well taken care of. And I said, that's great. He said, yeah, that, yeah, I, yeah. I said, okay, good. He said, well, okay, just make sure it's taken care of. And I said, okay, okay. He said, yeah, it's for a quarter of a million dollars. You know what I said? That is so nice. <laughs> that is a very sweet thing that you just did. No, I was slain in the spirit. <laughs> and was refilled with the Holy Ghost. And saw visions. I was like, I was like are, you, are you kidding me? I gave him a big hug. <laughs> I just want us to understand that when, when, when Mary, when, when, when she came into the room, that she did a very, very big thing. I don't know if she's married or not, but I just, there's no mention of it, so probably she's a single lady. So take a single lady that just 
sacrifices a year's salary for the sake of just loving someone called Jesus. That's huge. That's huge. Notice what Jesus says in his mount, or his sermon on the mount in Matthew chapter 5. Let me tell you why you're here. Let me tell you why you're here. This is a paraphrase from the message. You're here to be salt seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth. And if you lose your saltiness, how will people taste godliness? You've lost your usefulness and will end up in the garbage. Here's another way to put it. You're here to be light, bringing out the God colors in this world. God is not a secret to be kept. And we are going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. And if I make you light bearers, you don't think I'm going to hide you under a bucket, do you? I'm, I'm putting you on a light stand. And now that I've put you there on a hilltop, on a light stand, he says, shine. But then he says, keep open house. And what? Be generous with your lives. For by opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with their God, this generous Father that's in heaven. So the first step in Mary realizing what notability was all about, well-respected in heaven, well-regarded by Jesus, deeply appreciated by the Lord was the fact that she was first generous with her life. She was generous with her time. She was generous with her gifts. She was generous with her finances. She was generous with her life. She opened her heart to the Lord and held back nothing. So I ask you this morning, how do you personally interpret be generous with your lives? How do you interpret that? Does a couple hours on Sunday morning and 10% of your earnings qualify as being generous? I ask you because a lot of people, listen, there's a lot of people that claim Christianity that claim to be a follower of Christ. But that's all, that's about all they give him. Their lives are so compartmentalized. They have Jesus on Sunday from 10 to 12 or 10 to 11.30 or 10 to 11.15 or sometimes 10 to 10.45. And they know that they're to support the church and so they either tithe or tip, but they, at least they're writing a check and so they, they, they do these things. And it's like, a, it's like a religious checklist. And once they check it off the list, they drive out of the parking lot and they go, okay, I've got that compartment taken care of. Now I can go live my life. No, no. No, Jesus said, you, you, you take up your cross daily. And you follow me. So every morning that you arise, you take up your cross and you take up your commitment to do as God would have you to do. And then at the end of the day, you listen to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. It is a lifetime of commitment and service and loving affection that you give to God. I'm just telling you, friends, Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength is not something that you just do on Sunday. And we have, we have deceived ourselves that our pulpits across the land have deceived our people in believing if they'll just act right and just do these religious duties that they are candidates for heaven, but that's not the way the Bible reads it. We are disciples of Christ. We are followers of Christ. And it impacts every moment of every single day that we live because He is not just Lord on Sunday, but He is Lord every moment of every waking day. He is my King and my Savior, and I follow Him as best I can every chance I get. Put your hands together and give Him praise because that is kingdom service. Hallelujah. Praise God.
All I know is in Mary's case, now listen, in Mary's case, it took more than sitting and listening. And that was a good thing. It took kneeling and sacrificing before that, before that Jesus declared over her, this will never be taken from her. And it will be a memory spoken of her from, from generation to generation. She has done a very notable, beautiful thing for me. It's more than just kneeling and it's more than just sitting and listening. It's kneeling and sacrificing. Amen. Second thing, and I'll wrap this up with this. The second step from necessary to notable was she was willing to be misunderstood in her motives. In Matthew's gospel, we hear these condemning and criticizing words. Now, when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came up to him, Mary, with an alabaster flax, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. And when the disciples saw it, they were indignant, saying, Why this waste? For this could have been sold for a large sum and given to the poor. It's interesting to me, now listen, it's interesting to me that even the disciples and the church world criticized and condemned Mary's actions on that day. But what they call waste, heaven called worship. And what they call unbudgeted, Jesus called beautiful. And what they call unnecessary, the kingdom called Notable. Notable. As Mary slipped into the room, kneeling at the feet of Jesus and anointing his feet, his head with her most prized possession, this costly perfume. Listen, Mary did an unthinkable thing. That day she broke religious protocol without question. As she began to unfurl her hair and began to wipe and dry his feet, with her very hair. And I'm sure, I'm sure that if you would have been there, fly on the wall, reclining with Lazarus, you'd have heard the gasp. Those gasps and utter unbelief for a woman to publicly let her hair down in the presence of anyone but her husband was shameful and unacceptable. This was a, to be a private display of affection between lovers. And yet Mary, <laughs> she could not contain herself. She could not contain the deep love and devotion that burned in her heart for her Lord and her Savior. For He was more than a prophet. He was more than a teacher. He was more than a healer. He was more than a miracle worker. He was the nearest and dearest thing to her heart and she loved him more than life she loved him more than public opinion and more than personal gain he was her everything and her all without doubt and without debate and what was Jesus' response when Mary broke protocol and Mary did this outlandish thing of worship what was Jesus' response Leave her alone. <laughs> you back off and let her be. Oh, that God would once again step into our services, into our lives. And we are so exuberant and we are, we are so committed and we are so devoted and we are so willing to cross the line even in our worship to God even with criticized, being criticized or condemned, that Jesus would be forced to cry out, as he did on that day, just leave them alone. They're not doing it for you. They are here for me. And it is a beautiful thing. It is a notable thing that they are doing. God, help us to worship you to the point and the passion that even stirs up our neighbors around us. Jesus said, leave her alone. 
why do you trouble the woman? For she has done a beautiful thing to me. Then in Matthew 26, 12, and pouring this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. I want to repeat this verse again. What she has done is a notable thing. I just believe it's time that somebody began to break some religious protocols and become a living spectacle, kneeling at his feet, lavishing your love and affection on the one who has sacrificed everything so you can have everything. So in closing, I ask you this question. Are you standing in the kitchen? Are you standing in the kitchen just banging pots and pans together? Condemning and criticizing. You know, a critical spirit will, will rob you of your joy. A critical spirit will rob you of your peace, your purpose. And here's the deal, guys. If you're looking for dirt in the local church, you, you don't have to look very hard. It's there. Why? Because we're here. But for the grace of God, go every one of us. So if you're looking for perfection, you're going to live a frustrated life. Because there's no halos in this house. Only those that have been forgiven and are still struggling to get it right every single day. If you're looking for a perfect pastor, then you need to ask me to leave because I'm not your man. And I never will be your man. But I will tell you this one thing. I love him with all my heart. And I'm doing my best to serve him and follow him and point you in the direction of Christ every time I have the opportunity. Do I make mistakes? Oh, yeah. Do I ever get angry in traffic? Yes, 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 yes. Do I ever get a ticket? Yes, I paid one last week. Would you please watch your speed down May? (laughs) About two blocks. He sits right there. Now here's the here's the sad thing. He got he's got me twice. (laughs) In the same stinking spot. I mean, when I leave, I'm on a mission. I am the man of faith and power. I've got a world to win for Christ I don't have time to slow down but man he slowed me down I mean I go like I mean I you can you can outwalk me down May now I'm just telling you I'm just telling you I'm not perfect I'm not perfect but I serve one who is the ultimate perfection and he said look to me for I am the author and the finisher of your faith hallelujah and that good work that I have begun in you I shall complete it against that day hallelujah praise God so are you just banging pans in the kitchen critical and condemning of those around you Are you sitting and listening at his feet, soaking up the presence and the person of Jesus? And some of us, you know, we're there, and it's a wonderful place to be. It is. Sitting and soaking. Amen? How many love just sit and soak in the presence of the Lord? Because here's the deal. You're never going to be notable until you've dealt with the necessary. Yeah, you, you can't just skip from the kitchen, come on, to the courtroom of heaven. Not the courtroom. The kingdom of heaven. you got to have this relationship. But let me, just, let me just say this as we just wrap this up. The kingdom is never going to be what the kingdom needs to be as long as the church is just sitting and soaking. There comes a point, there comes a point that you've got to rise to your feet and you've got to be willing to take it to the next level. 
and you've got to be willing, come on now, to sacrifice what you've been freely given. There's time, it's time for some of you to stand to your feet and to go back into your bedroom and find that flask of what's most precious to you and pour it out, begin to pour it out on the one who has given you the very reason to live. Life itself. Amen. And begin to sacrificially offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God which is your what reasonable service so I don't know about you but Mary's choices concerning Jesus as I've studied this and re-examined this has challenged my life and my love and my devotion where am I at? am I in the kitchen? am I sitting and soaking? or am I kneeling and sacrificing? Is it needful, necessary, and notable? Where am I at in the whole mix? For Mary's generosity with her life as she poured it out on her Lord and King has messed with me. Mary's willingness to be understood as she lived her life for Him, not others, that has challenged me. That may say of each of us, each of us, they have done a beautiful thing to me. They have done a notable thing the cause of the kingdom so well done Miss Mary you have raised the bar and left a challenge for all of us to follow so Father we thank you this morning for the word of God we thank you Lord for your love for us and I pray this morning that you will allow this word that's been spoken to sink deep into our spirit God And may this good seed fall on good soil. And may it bring forth fruit and fruit that remains. And may we be that person that you've called us to be. God, may we be that notable, notable person in the kingdom, well respected of heaven deeply appreciated and loved by God himself. And God, I thank you for it now in Jesus' name.